Well, good morning. Special welcome as well to first-time guests. I'm grateful to have you here. It's daylight savings time, so we lost an hour. Um, it's the most feared Sunday of the year for a pastor. Um, so keep that coffee service going if you could for a little longer today. At the close of our service, we're going to do something special. We have a family that has received the call of God to surrender their lives to full-time missions work. Uh, the Deckard family will be going to Tijuana, Mexico to take over an orphanage and run it and take the gospel into that region. It's a city that is in great need of the gospel. The harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And God has called this family to enter into it. And so as a church, I desire to share our gifts and resources and time to help them as we seek by the grace of God alone to make advance uh, in this region for the kingdom of God, to love orphans, to see their salvation, and to make disciples of them. Uh, Nick and Jackie are going to share with us at the close of our service uh, this ministry. And so this was a very special morning for me as well, because the sending of this family represents so much uh, to me. Nick showed up at a college study that I was teaching. It's kind of a funny story. Olivia Pine, Jack and Jana's daughter, invited Nick's brother, who she worked with, to come to the Bible study. And Nick was uh, excited to see his brother going to a Bible study. But like a good brother, he wanted to come and make sure it wasn't false teaching or something crazy going on at this Bible study. And we were studying Romans, uh, believe it or not. That's funny. Uh, Nick was fired up at the end, and, and he never, he just started coming every week after that, and our hearts were instantly knit uh, over the glory and beauty of Christ, and a, a special bond was created. Uh, another funny story, I got to share this, Nick, is Nick just graduated college, and he came to me and said, I want to go to the mission field, but I, I haven't been able to find a wife, and I really feel like I should go uh, with a wife, and I just said, well, have you ever thought about Jackie? And he just, he said, well, she really is a godly woman. And then a week later, Jackie comes to me, and a guy from the college group asked her out, and she said, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, he's asked out 10 girls in the last month. I would say no, but have, have you thought about my servant, Nick? <laughs> and shortly... After that, we stood up here on the altar, and Jackie came walking down the aisle, and Nick squeezed my neck so hard I almost passed out as she <laughs> came walking down. Uh, what is so beautiful to me, though, is I've watched Nick give himself to the Lord and to this body and to its equipping. He's been faithful, available, and teachable, and, and he, he's been patient. The Lord caused him to grow and cemented things in him that he had no idea that he needed to grow. And so young men and women, as you're being equipped, here's an example of someone being patient under the hand of God and his training and his equipping. He was raised up as an elder here at Southside Bible Church. Ray and Robert poured in to help him find where his calling would be. And the whole body has poured into this sweet couple as they've poured into you. And uh, they have been authenticated and realized for this calling. So this is not a little thing. Uh, Nick asked for 15 minutes at the end of the service to share with you guys his calling. So it has been granted, and that's how we will close our service. And all of that to say as I have less time to preach this morning. So while we hold to the primacy of the Word of God and its teaching and preaching at this church, this is too beautiful of an extension of this body and its love for the, for, for the world that I, I, I want us to capture it as a body not to redeem it and rejoice together to, in God's manifested love to Tijuana in raising up this couple to bring the gospel to it is an amazing thing. This is the application of Romans. This is where we're moving and where we're going is we're not ashamed of this gospel. Tijuana has been ranked the most dangerous city in the world. Okay, This is a couple that are going to go and take this gospel at any cost. And my prayer is that many would receive this call as we uh, have I've been praying for the revival of 2020. We've got six baptisms lined up, and I just want you to keep praying because I, I just desire for many to come uh, into this kingdom. Paul, Paul's going to write in a few chapters later in Romans, Forever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? 
Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. However, they did not all heed the glad tidings for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you that you have uh, called. We thank you that you have uh, put within the Deckard's heart this call to go preach this gospel in Tijuana, to take the love of Christ to these orphans and to, to take the gospel into this whole community. God, I, I just rejoice the way you love Tijuana and we thank you for it. We thank you for raising this couple up and putting within their hearts a, a desire to forsake everything in this world that they might have Christ and proclaim his name. God, this gospel is worthy of that. It's worthy of more. And I pray that every heart in here would be so taken up with this gospel, they would lose their lives for it in any way that you ask them to serve. God, I pray that we will be those who take them into our neighborhoods and families and schools and, and, and just, God, light our hearts with the glory and the beauty of a gospel as this. I pray, meet us here this morning as we open the word of God. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. All right, so... What we're going to do this morning is we we're going to begin chapter 2. We finished Romans chapter 1 last week, and uh, chapter 2, 1 through 4 has been a life-changing study for me, and I, I, I need a, almost a whole hour to do it. So we're going to hold off on chapter 2 this morning, and I, what I want to do is make application of Romans chapter 1. You remember when we began, and I shared with you uh, 20 years ago when I preached through Romans, we were grounding ourselves in the doctrine and the truth of the gospel, and it laid a foundation that this church has been living on. We, we love this gospel. And one of the things that I wanted to focus on this time was the, the, the beginning and the end of Romans. Paul says, I want to bring about the obedience of faith. I, I want this gospel to bring about those who will believe it and those who will live and obey the Lord Jesus Christ out of faith. And so how these doctrines get into our minds and we understand them and they get into our hearts and into our wills to go live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we finish up chapter one, I just want to pull out now and give you a bird's eye view of what we saw. And then let's make personal application for the obedience of faith to make sure you're not just taking notes and marking up your Bibles. We want to come out of chapter one with God. What do you want from me? What do I believe and how do I live in light of what we saw in Romans chapter one? So that's my goal this morning. And so here's your little bird's eye of chapter one. Paul starts with this gospel that God gave him and it wasn't a new gospel. It's, it's a, been preached through all the prophets and the law. They all pointed to Christ and told us of this gospel of, of Jesus Christ who would come and be born of a seed of David. And his humanity, he would die on a cross in our place. And then that seed would be buried and this David would not undergo decay and he's raised and seated now and his kingdom has begun and he conquered death. This one was shown to be the power of God. He is God as he was raised up from the tomb. That gospel, that gospel, he said in verse 14, makes us debtors to go tell every person, tribe, tongue, nation, race, every, any, there's no disqualifications. Everyone, we take the gospel. I owe a debt because God saved me and gave me grace when I didn't deserve it and wasn't seeking it. I just must tell others this gospel. So Paul tells us we're debtors because God showed us grace. So I'm eager to come to you in Rome. I'm eager to preach you the gospel because I'm not ashamed of it, because the gospel is the power of God to bring people into this realm of salvation. There's no other way to get right with God than through the power of this gospel. And in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed uh, from all who believe from faith to faith. And then Paul tells us there's something else being revealed as well daily. And he said in verse 18, it's the wrath of God. <clears throat> in a present tense, daily the wrath of God is being revealed and so it isn't just the wrath that's going to be that cataclysmic judgment at the end of the age when God will bring that great judgment and the outpouring of his wrath that ends in the eternal fires forever. This was a different wrath. This was a wrath that God has made a creation and this creation demands, it tells you there's a God. It's so clear, his invisible attributes and divine power have been clearly seen from what has been made so that men are without excuse. 
and, and what men did with this creation that just preaches God is we suppressed it in unrighteousness and we didn't want this God in our mind. We didn't see him worthy and we suppressed him. And instead of worshiping this God, and we should have, uh, he said you should have given him honor and you should give him thanks. Instead, we responded in the complete opposite way. We made idols. We, we made idols. We, we worshiped other things than this creation that tells you worship the creator. And we started making things out of birds and animals and our own desires and our own hearts. We worship created things instead of the creator. And it's a big deal to God. And therefore, wrath, wrath. You don't want me. You want all your little created things that can't deliver you or save you or help you. Here you go. Have it. I give you over. And you're going to go into all these sins three times. God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. This is why the world is such a mess. This is what Adam and Eve's idolatry did. It plunged us into this sin now. And we worship things created instead of the creator. God's wrath is upon us. And I want to make sure that you don't miss this. God's wrath does not make us go sin. But because we choose sin and idols over him, uh, he lets us go our own course. Have it. (laughs) So what we see as to why the world is the way it is, is why we are not evolving, but we are devolving, is because of the exchange that was made from God to idols. It's a spiritual issue why our world is so broken. It's a matter of worship as to why we are the way we are. We're broken because we were made to worship God and find Him at the center of all of our affection and desires and what we seek. We're a broken people because we exchanged that for idols. That's where we blow it. And we look at a world, and we try to figure out how to fix this world in all of its sin and brokenness. The world is at least awake to say something's wrong. And we try education, and prisons, and moral slogans, and government, and legislation. And we throw millions and billions of dollars at all of the problems, <clears throat> and we just keep cleaning up a pig but not changing the heart, and we just keep running into pig slop again and again. The root issue is an issue of worship and giving God glory and giving Him thanks. And that's to lead us to the true issue, that there's a righteousness that's revealed, that there's a way to be made right with God and to stand in perfect righteousness before Him, loved and accepted. And so there is a way to be fixed. And that is where I want to go this morning. So because in many seasons and times and areas, even this morning in the church, we we tend to make the same mistake. If you look at the sins we looked at last time in verses 28 through 32, you you take those sins and we try to go and just clean them up. We just want to fix them. And when I I used to take my kids over to this place called Family Sports. You remember it, Taylor? Josh? George? Kelsey here? No? And we'd go over to Family Sports and there was this, this little club you got and these things would pop up and you had to go hit them. And, and then the faster, it would go faster and faster until you're just like going crazy trying to hit all these things down. And that was like 10 years of my Christian life trying to fight sin. I got this one. I got this one. And you just keep trying to fix and clean up the flower of sin. And it's so easy to, to just look at flowers and not roots, which is an issue of misplaced worship according to Romans chapter 1, verse 25. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And that's our problem. <clears throat> and so believers, we were in a death spiral that we looked at in Romans 1. God gave you over and no one has ever been able to pull themselves out of that spiral. When you just, you can't get out of it. You're stuck by nature and by your inheritance from Adam, the imputed sin. You, you can't pull out of it. You can't change your nature. You can't change your record. You can't get the wrath of God off you. You're just stuck. There's no remedy for it in yourself. And then we see God's grace. The power of the gospel has revealed his righteousness that he can pull you out of the death spiral and he can wash you and cleanse you and give you new hearts, give you the gift of faith. And we respond by believing the gospel and his son. And now God declares you not guilty. You're not guilty before God. You're justified. And then God begins to grow you and cleanse you in what we call sanctify you. And so I want you to get this this morning. 
Sin's penalty was, was cured by Christ hanging on a cross and living the life for us. And sin's power of Romans 1 was broken because it had you because of your idolatry and your misplaced worship. It, it, it cures it and it gets you now back to worshiping God through this gospel. And what we have now then as believers, so I'm preaching to believers, you have remaining sin. So that reigning sin was broken, but now every one of us, what we're battling is there's still remaining sin until we are glorified at the end of the age. We can still suppress the truth of God. We can still suppress it and look to idols to satisfy our souls. John Calvin <coughs> said the human heart is an idol factory. It just can create idols and make them. So even as believers, we got this hangover and remaining sin that still wants to look to other things to be God, to satisfy us. We can be deceived and make the same exchange in our Christian journey that we were doing when we were a slave to it in Romans 1. And so the human heart, it has to worship or serve something. And if you don't worship the true God, you will worship something else. The way we were created is we have to live for something. Something will capture the highest passion of your heart. And it's as simple as if I, have, if I have that, I will be happy and my life will be worthwhile. I'll be somebody then if I get that. Whatever your highest hope or allegiance is, that is what you worship. Whatever you have to have to be happy, that's your idol. <clears throat> Sorry for my cough today. Colossians 3, Paul said that greed is idolatry. It's just greedy and I got to have more. God's not enough. I want that. So simply put, idolatry is looking to something to give you the kind of hope and value and safety that only God himself can give to you. And that is the spiral of Romans 1. That's the fruit of not worshiping God alone and giving him thanks. So Romans 1 are people looking for something to give them what only God can give. And it's the wrath of God to give you over to these idols and, and die in them in Romans 1. And when you do that, you become like an animal, like your idol, like uh, you're, you're made to be image bearers of God and now you start becoming like your idols and, and you become miserable and you live in fear and anxiety and if I don't get this or don't keep it, my, my life is over. And so your life starts getting controlled. And, and in Romans 1.24, these desires, the Greek word is what we've looked at so many times is epithumias. Thumias are desires and epi are over desires. And you get these over desires that you must have to be happy or to be satisfied. And you put them in the place of God. And that's what I want to look at this morning. To truly grow to go after the flower of sin, it'll never get to the true issue. So my prayer for you is that you quit fighting flowers and you get to the roots. And so when we just say, just say no to drugs, you're just never going to get to the root problem. When we say, just say no to sex, just say no to anger or jealousy, it's not going to fix your problem. Thomas Chalmers wrote the book, The Expulsive Power of of a new affection. And so the, the, the only way to cure it is to get to your root issues of worship. And you need something greater than your idols, a greater desire, something better to drive out your idols and everything that we're fighting and battling with. And that new affection is Jesus Christ. Our idols must be smashed and broken at the feet of Jesus. And so at the righteousness that's being revealed in this gospel, and the just shall live by faith in it. This is, John says, this is what will overcome the world, our faith. And so as we believe this gospel and live into who Christ is, that's going to break these idols. And so I want to take a look at that this morning. This will be our application as believers to Romans 1. <clears throat> Obviously, the first one, the application I want you to walk away with first is to give thanks to God because you were in a death spiral and none of you could have ever pulled yourself out of it. And I pray that everyone in this room has come to that place where you finally realized, I can't clean myself up. I can't stop. I can't fix my nature. I can't get God's wrath off of me. And God is the one who came and pulled you out of that spiral. And he gave you Jesus Christ and faith 
to see and believe and to be healed and pulled out of that spiral. And you sit here today as a child of God, loving him, reconciled to him. I pray that everyone in this room treasures that and loves the beauty of that. That, that has to come out of this. <clears throat> but I want you to learn from the passage how to fight our hearts that can run back so quickly to this old man and this old way of thinking that we were in Adam. See, the devil's desire is that we worship anything but God. He, he wants you to worship anything but God, and he is given to that and his demons and his cohorts daily to keep us from that. This whole world system is built to keep us from that. So there are certain subjects I run to when I'm studying topics. So if I want to learn about delight in God, who do you go to? Yell it out. Thank you. If you want just the best exegesis of just the, the text, who do you run to? John MacArthur. <laughs> and if you want church structure, who do you run to? Dever. Exact. Idols. Tim Keller. Okay. Uh, counterfeit gods. And I just, the reason I bring it up is he's led my thinking so much this morning. He, he gave me insight into this. So I want to give him credit for the, 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 the insight that he's given to me. So I'm going to borrow from some of his thoughts and just shepherding and battling my own sin. And, and what I want to do this morning, here's your outline, is I want to look at how to break our idols, you know, how to, how to smash them. And I want to look at our past, our present idols, and our future idols. So we've looked at them from many different ways in, at this church, but this morning I, I want to look at it more from past, present, and future. So as we come from Romans 1, this is what I want you to come away with uh, as your, one of your pastors. Past. When my idol is in the past, <clears throat> doesn't that sound a little weird? How does my idol be in the, the past? <laughs> Usually it's a present thing that I want or something I'm wanting in the future. How do I have an idol in the past? Well, I, I've seen this idol actually. It, it is so common to the saints of God. I see this idol more than present and future idols. It's a very common idol. And what it is, is guilt can become so controlling in your life from the past that it, it just has you all of your days. You serve it. You're just a bond slave to your past. You have all these regret and remorse for decisions and things you wish you did different. And it just, it has control of you. It, it, it controls you more than the living Christ. <laughs> it's past decisions, mistakes, my life has turned out all wrong and, and it owns you like this little idol every day. I've ruined my life. It's not what I wanted and, and I just am miserable and I'm sad because of my past. And you just sit in this idolatry and you won't let the gospel set you free. Hurts and evils that have been done to you, I can't forgive. And your whole life is going to be held by the hurt that someone has done to you because you cannot forgive. It, it has you. It owns you. <coughs> Parenting. This is why I am the way I am. Everything that, that go, you, know, you, you blame your parents, your, your, your whole life has been ruined by what they did. Every time something goes wrong, it's my parents, what they did to me, and that's why I'm this way. <laughs> or everything that I can't achieve is because my parents didn't educate me right. And your whole life is this big idol of blaming your parents for everything. Stop. Your past sin. I've done something so bad. There's no way God can forgive me. Or I'll tell everybody, God forgives me, but it just sits on me and it's a weight and there's a shame. I can't even walk up to people and talk and be transparent because I just can't believe that I was forgiven for this past sin. And there's someone in my life that reminds me of it every day. And I can't get rid of it. I have an enemy who reminds me every day. And so I've got this idol called past sin that is controlling your worship this morning. Maybe your idol's a happy family. Anybody got that one? <laughs> and when it is, my performance as a parent is, is, is now valuable above anything else. And if my son or daughter goes off the tracks, I'm not just sorrowful and grieved but I'm stricken with a neurotic guilt. And I mean neurotic. I can't forgive myself. 
I hate myself. I even want to die. And I just live in that all day long and it holds me and pulls me down. I have people with a, you have an idol of high school, <laughs> how people viewed me, what they thought of me, how they treated me, and it's affected me every day since. I can't get over it. This idolatry of the past will sink you in the present to all the sins listed in Romans 1, 28 through 32. It'll just, it'll just pull in again and again into these patterns. <laughs> if the just shall live by faith, in the gospel, there's a righteousness revealed. And that righteousness, I want you to hear it by faith, today tells you, you are cleansed and accepted by God. You stand in his righteousness and he loves you and he accepts you. You're loved by God in this gospel. And all my past sins, mistakes, is all forgiven, released as far as the east is from the west. My past hurts that have been done to me and all my wrongs released. And I live in a Romans 8, 28, that everything in my past now I see that God was using for my good. Even my mistakes, even my sin, I can now be set free to say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I watch so many walking around with the hurts and the weights of your past. In Philippians 3, Paul says, forgetting what lies behind. And that Greek word, it doesn't mean to get out of your memory bank, because you can't but it means to no longer be affected by. To not be affected by your past where it, it's an idol and it, it has you and it controls everything. Your, your past controls you more than Jesus Christ. That's what I want to set you free from this morning. I'm praying and asking God. I know so many of you who have the idol of your past and it, it, it controls you more than Christ. And I, I want you to be set free in a gospel that can forget what lies behind and reach forward to what lies ahead of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's freedom. There's freedom in this. Father, I pray. I love these saints so much. And I know so much of their past is not being set free in this gospel. There's a righteousness revealed from heaven by faith. And to just be done with how the world identified them or past hurts. God, set them free from all of these idols and hurts and pains and brokenness. And let Jesus Christ calm and wash and clothe them in righteousness. And hear a father say, this is my son or daughter and who I am well pleased. God, let that not be theological. Let it break idols this morning. Let them see it in a way by faith that they never have and release them from these idols who are doing so much damage to them on a day-to-day -day basis. Please, God, I cry for the good of these brothers and sisters. And in my own heart, amen. Present idols. What do I need right now to make me happy other than God? And I want you to answer that right now in your heart. Is there something I need to be happy other than more of Christ. You'll be discontent if with a present idol. You'll be jealous of anyone who has what it is that you want. You'll be mad that God's withholding it. You'll never, most Christians won't say I'm mad at God, but I'm mad because he's withholding this from me. Much of our prayer is God, give me my idols. This is what I got to have. And you just will keep praying to God. I got to have this or I'll never be happy. And you're praying to God while you've misplaced your rightful place and you got some idol saying, here, God, give me my idol. Why is he not answering your prayer? Because he loves you. <laughs> if something or someone stands between me and that something, that's my ultimate value, look out. You'll, you'll see if it's an idol. Suppose your career is your ultimate worth. That's my identity. That's what I'm running after. And someone at work is harming it. Someone is gossiping about you or they're, they're in more with the boss. You won't be upset. You're going to become deeply bitter and seethe and you're going to quit sleeping at night and it's just going to have you and control you. How about all, my idol is I got to have a boyfriend. <laughs> and a girl shows up to the college group who's really cute with a godly personality and all the guys are paying her attention and you start gossiping and slandering to do whatever you can to bring that girl down. 
<laughs> what is it you made an idol uh, out of your moral behavior? Maybe that's your idol. God owes me the good life. I've obeyed scripture. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I've served him. I've done it. And now a difficult trial comes and you're bitter against God or maybe life itself. You can't enjoy life anymore because you deserve better and it's not fair and you're stuck right here. God, I did everything and my life did not turn out the way you said. You said train up a child in the way he'll go when he's old, he won't depart. And he departed. And you're just bitter because of your idol that God didn't give right now what I want. In our text, it was sexuality. I just want pleasant, present pleasure and I'll throw away all of God's design for marriage and sex and just take it. Paul says the just shall live by faith. That right now I have everything in Christ. I have everything in Christ. And I want to honor him and I want to give him thanks. I live by faith into that daily. I have everything. Instead, I've got to have something more. Future idols. This will be the idol that brings anxiety and worry. I can't trust God for my future. He's not going to get it right. <clears throat> my idol is how I think the future needs to be and what it has to be. And so I've got this idol of what it has to be. And, and, and I, 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 I'm anxious because I got to get it. God's not getting it right, so I'm doing everything I can to make sure it happens. I live in fear of that all the time. Oh, my parenting is just fear. It's just fear. Something out in the future that's going to get me. I know it's coming. It's in the back of my head. And I'm always planning and strategizing how to take care of the future. And I'm buying insurances and, and, and cleaning my hands because of a virus. And I'm reading news and articles to protect myself instead of faith that God is in the future. And I'm going to be his child in the future. And I'm blessed forever, it says in our passage. He's going to bless. He's blessed forever. And he will bless me forever. God is in the future. And I'm going to be in there with him, accepted and loved. It just melts away all the fear of the future. God's there. A Proverbs 31 woman looks at the future and smiles. Because God's there. How about a threat from a coronavirus? <laughs> it just came to me this week. <laughs> it's got people. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> we, we live in a world that, that there's, there's a threat that we don't know enough about, and everyone's coming undone. When I tell you right now, there's a greater virus out there called sin that puts you in the spiral of Romans 1. And if I had the, the cure for the coronavirus, man, I would take it everywhere and anywhere. But I have the cure for the S chromosome called sin that has destroyed you and has you stuck in that spiral. <laughs> Give me the gospel. That's for free. Suppose your, your future worry is politics. You're, you're a Democrat or a Republican. And when my party experiences a great defeat, I'm not just sad. I'm shaking to my depths. I'm going to move from this country. I'm going to get out of this state of Colorado. I can't speak to anyone who voted for that person. It's just going to own you or destroy you. How about I just want to be someone? When I, when I finished my life, I just want to be someone. I did something. I, I left this great mark. There's just a fear of, I just got to be something, and I don't want to finish without it. And God might call us to ordinary lives, like he says in the scriptures. Maybe it's an idol of the future, and you're always thinking about it, and you're always wor worried about it. What is mine? And I, I just want you set free this morning from the idol of future. Because whatever the future is, is what God has decreed. And he's going to be with you. He's not going to leave you or forsake you in the future. He doesn't forsake you today and he won't forsake you tomorrow. And so I just want you to throw down the idols of past, and present, and future. How, do, how can I escape this sin of idolatry? As we continue in Romans, Paul's going to show us in verse 25 exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator <coughs> who is blessed forever. Amen. As we worship and serve the creator, 
who is blessed forever. That's where we'll find it. I, I mean, when I preach through First Peter, I, I, I like that word epithumia. You guys know that, but I think it opens up the whole Bible. But do you remember when it said the angels have epithumias as they look into the, the mercy of God and the gospel? They're just wanting to see what is this because they didn't experience mercy, the fallen ones. So what is this gospel? And they have a, a lust, an epithumia for the gospel. And so what I want to tell you is the remedy for our idols is a lust, a desire for the gospel of Jesus Christ to look into it, to believe it. The just shall live by faith. And when I can stay in it and, and realize there's a righteousness revealed and, and who I am with God and my acceptance, when I stay there, I have, there's no idols that tempt me at all. It's just, I can't be tempted. When I, when I lose that, everything tempts me to think that this is what will really make me happy. And so we fight the fight of faith against our idols. And we fight the fight of faith and the temptation to the past. And all the things that I've done or my sins or where I made bad decisions. And, I, and by faith, I got, I got to believe and know that all that past is forgiven. And it's, it's not, what, what owns me in the future is not my past decisions, but Christ. And, I, and so I, I can drop that idol of the past and, and release it. And the idol of the present in this gospel, I have Jesus Christ and I have all of his fullness. And so I, I, I got what I need. Nothing else in the present is what I, I'm longing and what I really need. And, and all the cure for the future. I don't have to worry about the future. I, my, my future is Christ. It's so healing. Anytime I get anxious, just by faith, I look at him again and all of his excellencies. And it just, it's, it's healing. It's like when the, when the storms, they're afraid and he goes, shh, and the waves just flatten. That's what Christ can do when we believe and look into this gospel. Because there's a lot to be afraid of. There really is. Unless you're a Christian. <laughs> then you got, I just fear God, that's it. I, f I fear nothing with human breath. I, I showed that last week talking about homosexuality. I got a hate note on the front door. Okay? We, we fear nothing with human breath. But we, we fear God and there's such safety and peace and beauty in that. So it's so amazing when the deepest passions of your heart are adoring and praise, praising Jesus, then all other passions are put in the right place. And so Romans 1 through 3 should cause us to adore the grace of God and satisfy the deepest longings of my heart. And guys, that's why we need books like Romans to look at this gospel again and to stare and believe and put it where it belongs. And you can throw down every idol as you look at the gospel and see the righteousness of God revealed to you and just be so taken up with his love that it will break and smash your idols. William Cowper said, The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Amen? Amen. There's an upcoming ladies' retreat. And one of our ladies from our church is going to share what I just went over about an idol that she had with her own son. And she's going to share with you guys that it was the sufficiency of Jesus Christ that set her free and gave her joy in the middle of one of the hardest trials uh, you could ever face. And so I, I, I am excited and I encourage you ladies to sign up uh, and be a part of that. So any questions? All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this gospel. I love it. I love that it smashes idols from the past, the present, the future. Lord, help us to not fight flowers, but to, to fight roots of misplaced worship, of, of finding other things to satisfy us besides Jesus Christ. This gospel makes our soul so satisfied in Jesus Christ. We don't need anything else. We have we have the cure for idolatry. Just help us to look at it and love it and believe it and abide with him. God, let Christ give us eyes of faith and let us be growing in this word to see more of his glory. And God, let it put all of our other desires in the right place when Christ is supreme. And so God, thank you for Romans chapter one. Create a people who, who, who don't have idols, but just have you at the center of their affection and love and delight. God, I thank you for this. In Christ's name we pray, amen.